Paul, thanks for uh, joining me this week. We had some really, really fun games over the weekend. And I don't think a soul, not even the brilliant Paul Burmeister, back in August, picked a rams Bengals Super Bowl. Now, you can, you can dispute that all you want, but I, I have proof. I don't think you picked that. I think you had one half of it correct, though, Peter. I, I do remember you going with the Rams, so you're at least a little bit more on the correct side than me. I did have the AFC North in, in the Super Bowl, if that counts for anything, but it was the Browns, so I was, yeah. I was way off. And you are, you, you are in a very nice suite there, Peter. The Peter King name still carries some weight there in Cincinnati, <laughs> I see. I, I need to check yeah, in under I that mean, alias I checked next in. Time I'm, there. I, I'm, I'm here at the Hyatt in downtown Cincinnati. And uh, I, I don't know. I just walked up to the desk and they gave me a very nice room. So thank you to the Hyatt in Cincinnati. Uh, it's Tuesday morning and I've already been out. I've been up since five o'clock this morning and I've already been out and about. And I left the hotel about 515 this morning for a meeting. And I'll tell you the really interesting thing, Paul, I lived here in Cincinnati and started my career at the Cincinnati Inquirer in 1980. And obviously this town is on fire. Um, you know, yesterday when I checked into the hotel, I turned on the evening news channel five, the NBC affiliate in Cincinnati. The first 34 minutes of the news um, was the Bengals and the weather. There's going to be a storm here later in the week. So uh, it was all Bengals all the time, punctuated by about three storm warning uh, weather forecasts. But that's what I remember about Cincinnati. When they've got a sports team that's on fire, they go nuts. And so, um, and look, Paul, I don't know about you. I think they got a shot. I mean, I, I just think back to Joe Burrow a couple of years ago. In the 2019 season at LSU, going into Alabama, everybody said, oh, here's where Joe Burrow is going to get exposed. And it was actually Joe Burrow who exposed Alabama that day. And I just think, I think Burrow's just not afraid of anything. And, you know, I've talked to Zach Taylor, the Bengals coach about that. And, and, and he basically said to me, there is not a situation that Joe Burrow doesn't feel like he's going to conquer. Look at the way he's answered the bell and the team has answered the bell really for the last month. And I remember well, Peter, I think we, we spent some time talking about the crazy numbers that he put up offensively against the Ravens when they had basically nobody uh, that should have been on the team playing in that defensive backfield. Since then, though, I mean, they have beaten good teams. They're scoring over 30 points routinely. Burrow, I mean, how many times has he made a poor decision in the last month? I mean, you, you really have to go back and look. Um, so that they've shown up at every single game. Uh, they er erased an 18-point deficit at Arrowhead. So uh, back to your original point that you wouldn't be surprised or that they have a real chance in the Super Bowl. I, I think anybody would be foolish to think just because they have those uniforms on and because it says Bengals that they don't have a real strong chance to go in there and win. Well, let's take a minute, and uh, I just want to review a little bit uh, the two games that we saw over the weekend, Kansas City against Cincinnati, where, as you said, the Bengals came back from a 21-3 deficit uh, to win that game. Huge stop at the end of the first half for the Bengals, so it wasn't such a daunting task entering the last a uh, few minutes of the game, the last 30 minutes of the game. And then uh, the game that I was at, the, uh, uh, the Rams 49ers game where, you know, the Rams came back from 17-7 down late to win. And Paul, I guess I would start off by saying that I think at this time of year, what, all, what I always feel is that the two most important elements, and this is far to this is overarching and and a little bit easy but I think at this time of year the two most important elements on any team is you got to have a quarterback playing well and you got to be hot and I think both of these teams have shown that they have a quarterback playing well and look everybody's going to say well wait a second Matthew Stafford 
been inconsistent, all that other stuff. And he did have, you know, the Jaquaski tart uh, drop interception late that really kind of saved their bacon. But look, I'll just say this in these three playoff games, you know, Matthew Stafford, one turnover and everybody is, you know, has wondered when is Detroit Matt going to show up? And I think that impresses me that at the biggest moments of his life, he's played some of his most efficient football. I think Matthew Stafford has been terrific, Peter. And I would say just kind of as we open the door to both of these games, you talk about how you have to have a hot quarterback and a kicker. Uh, I would also add, uh, while I have the chance to, that you got to have a strong counterpunch too. Uh, somewhere in there, in addition to that quarterback being wonderful and the kicker coming through, a couple of the supplementary parts have to step up too. And look at the Bengals' defense and what they did. Right. I mean, of all the units we didn't talk about much in the postseason or it didn't, it didn't get a lot of attention, Cincinnati's defense. And I know we're going to spend time on that. And also, like, look at the Rams. Cooper Cup's terrific, but Odell Beckham Jr. as a supplement, over 100 yards. So the counter punches for both teams, in addition to the kicker and quarterback, I thought really stood out on Sunday. Well, so let's go into the Rams just a little bit. I'll tell you, covering that game, first of all, uh, you know, obviously it's a two-year-old stadium, SoFi. This is the first year they've had, you know, big crowds in there. Um, this stadium is a work of art. It's utterly, utterly beautiful. And I think the people who get to see it for the first time at the Super Bowl are going to be highly, highly impressed. And they should. It costs whatever, $4 billion or whatever. I saw Stan Kroenke after the game, and I just was thinking, walking him ushered through a crowd of people, uh, you know, one of the richest men in America. I just started thinking to myself, you got your money's worth for this stadium. This is, it's a great place. But, you know, you talk about, the other elements on a team. And this is really what stood out to me about the Rams. You know, Odell Beckham Jr. has been <clears throat> on that team now for about nine or 10 weeks. And Paul, <clears throat> you can just tell the comfort level that Matthew Stafford has with Odell Beckham. If you look at, you know, how often, obviously Cooper Cup is his bread and butter. You know, as Les Snead, the GM uh, of the Rams, has told me, he's, in essence, another quarterback on the field. That's how much he studies the game, and that's how much he knows the game plan. He knows everybody's job. And, and I think as, as, the most, as good as Cooper Cup is, and he's got the best numbers now of any receiver over the course of a full season, including playoffs in NFL history, I think what has really lifted the Rams is the fact that Matthew Stafford can look at Odell Beckham Jr. as much as he does. If you look at the beginning of that game, who does he hit right away twice very early on? Uh, Odell Beckham Jr. And Paul, it's the old thing about, you know, when Odell Beckham was late with the Giants and then in his time in Cleveland, the story about Odell Beckham Jr. is get him involved early or you're not going to get the full Odell. And that's what I have seen Sean McVay do over and over again. He tries to get him a couple of touches very early in the game. And I, I think making that point mean all the more, Peter. Remember on that first drive, I think the drive ended where Beckham was open over the middle and Stafford threw high and behind him. And it's a ball that Stafford would tell you, man, I've got to throw that better 99 times out of 100. And Beckham would probably say, I've got to catch that ball 90 times out of 100. So kind of a drop, definitely a bad pass by Stafford. Next drive, they come back to him over the middle again, Peter, on basically the same play. And he's, he's tightly covered. He gets hit. He goes down and catches the ball. So what I've been impressed with, and yes, they are going to him early, I think, to prove a point to him and to the team. But it hasn't been the giant flash kind of plays like, oh, wow, look at Odell Beckham Jr. It's kind of the meat and potato, nuts and bolts kind of throws over the middle or to the sideline that he's coming through on most of the time. So I, 
I like the range of his game. And who knows, he might have a one-handed catch and have some spectacular kind of plays in the Super Bowl. Uh, but he's just been coming through with the nice, I hate to say routine plays, but the unspectacular plays uh, like he did on Sunday. You know, the other thing about Odell uh, that I noticed in this game, you saw him take a huge hit, helmet yes. to helmet hit late yeah. from Jimmy Ward. And look, I, I made a point in my column to uh, credit Odell Beckham for, for his, for his toughness in just standing up, going back to the huddle, uh, you know, it's 12 and counting. I counted them last night, emails to me, highly critical of me for don't give a guy credit, uh, you know, for glorifying how he deals with a helmet to helmet hit. And I understand that we are in, in society right now. And, and as people who watch football, that's what they're trying to get out of the game. And I absolutely understand it. I'm not saying, oh my gosh, what a great play. And he got hit and he bounced back up. It's wonderful. I don't give, I, I'm not saying that, oh, wow, what a, what a play. You know, he got hit in the helmet and he got up. What I'm saying is when you are on a football team and you're playing your biggest game of the year and you get, take a huge hit, Whatever it is, you take a rib shot, you take a head shot, whatever it is, you get a lot of credit in your locker room. And you know this, Paul, as somebody who played in the Big Ten and at a high level, you're going to look at a guy like, okay, he he's he's into it today. You know, he he and and, and that was really kind of what I meant that he bounced right back up. Hey, let's go. It's not like he got up and said, Oh, come on, Jimmy Ward, I want to fight you. He just said, OK, let's go. And I I give him a lot of credit. And I bet he woke up on Monday and wasn't feeling really good after that one. I think the physical toughness he showed there, uh, Peter, definitely shows up. And no matter your position, no matter the time of year, your teammates look at you differently when you string together uh, a certain amount of plays where you're showing a lot of toughness. I'll also point out his mental toughness and his maturity. And you do expect a player with a lot of years in the league to not respond to that. But he's had moments in the past where he could have come out of that with a moment where he kind of made it about him. The wheels kind of start to come off a little bit on the field, on the sideline, and he didn't do that. So it's not so much that you're complimenting a player for being a mature adult professional. He's supposed to be. You're just recognizing that, that there have been times in the past where a play like that could have caused him to react in a different way. Paul, I spent a few minutes with Matthew Stafford after the game in the middle of the mayhem and all that. And I, as I pointed out in my column, you know, it's, it's it, it, it down honestly to the minute. Um, he had confetti flying over his head uh, at 6.45 p.m. on Sunday Pacific time, you know, celebrating getting his team to the Super Bowl. And that is absolutely precisely one year down to the minute when they made the agreement and on a Zoom call, the Rams negotiators and uh, Brad Holmes, the uh, Lions general manager, were making this deal, the Matthew Stafford for Jared Goff deal. And I think Stafford was so blown away when I told him about that, that it's like exactly a year, you know, right down to this. And, uh, and, he, and he said, and I said, you know, it's, it's shocking, really, when you figure that here it is one year later and you're going to the Super Bowl. And he, and he made an interesting point. He said that, look, you know, I, I'm not that emotional a guy, you know, and I'm paraphrasing him, but he said, it's really unbelievable what has happened in the span of this year. You move your family out, you, uh, you, you know, soak in a new offense, you get everything done, um, you would just on the fly to so many things, losing Cam Akers before the start of training camp, um, trading for Sony Michelle, uh, it, getting used to a new team, moving your family, uh, it, you know, and having to uh, uh, adapt and adopt on the fly Odell Beckham Jr. in this offense. So I, I, I have to tell you, hats off to Matthew Stafford. I think he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for what he accomplished. 
you point out kind of what, what's happened in the entire year and how it's impressive. It's amazing with, with all that's happened. I can shrink that down, Peter, and just kind of look at the last month. Remember, remember the end of the regular season when the Rams defense was really starting to come on? And I think he threw eight picks in that last four games. And if you were a yeah. Rams fan, you're like, come on, Matthew. Just, I mean, don't hold this defense back. Just don't turn the football over and we're going to have a chance to make some noise in January. And that first playoff game really played out perfectly coming on the heels of that difficult end of the regular season for him when they beat Arizona, didn't have to throw the ball much less than 20 times defense led the way they were out in front. It was kind of an exhale. And these last two games, he has accelerated Peter to the point where I went back and looked at the numbers. He's thrown it 38 and 45 times the last two games. The Rams have not had a two game stretch where he has thrown the ball that much and they've won both games. And to me, that says a lot about how he's playing, how they're trusting him, how he's feeling it. And th there was a sequence early in the second quarter, Peter, that I just loved. I thought it was a perfect snapshot of where he is right now. On their first scoring drive, he hit Cooper Cup. I think it was third down and six, Peter. He was on the left hash, threw a deep out route to the right hash, and he had to throw it way before Cooper came out of that cut. And that, that yeah. is a high-level pros, pros pass on a third down. A couple plays later on third and 13, he hits Cooper Cup again for that first touchdown. And I thought, man, here's a guy who's feeling it. And we can talk about defenses playing well and, and the play caller doing well. But at some point, whether it's September, January, February, your quarterback's got to make a lot of tough throws on third down. And he did that a lot. They were over 50% on third down. And that two-play two third down sequence there that led to their first touchdown, uh, there are a lot of good snapshots of what he's doing but I thought that was about perfect of where he is right now with that team. Paul, let's go over and talk about the Bengals a bit. Um, you know, I had a conversation with Zach Taylor and, and I basically said to him, you know, one year ago, you guys are coming off a four and 11 in one season. Burrow is coming off major surgery and he, and he got the surgery in December. So there was a legitimate chance and legitimate thought that he's not going to be able to play in nine months. You, you know, that's less than nine months after surgery is when the opener is. So there's a lot of negatives there. They're, you know, Zach Taylor himself was 625 and one in his first two years. Wow. And as he has said, and as he told me, he almost certainly in many places would have gotten fired. And so he understands that, but I, there's one other thing coming off last year that doesn't get talked about enough. Last year, the Cincinnati Bengals in a 16 game season had 17 sacks. Hmm. That's just putrid. It's putrid. And, and what happened in this off season is not only that Jamar Chase gets drafted and Joe Burrow gets healthy you know, faster than, than the Bengals thought he would. It's not only that, but it is that they added two huge pieces, in my opinion, one famous one, Trey Hendrickson, and one very minor, very unnoticed, okay? And that is B.J. Hill gets traded from the Giants to the Bengals right before the start of the season for Billy Price, who never achieved a first round center from Ohio state and it's center and guard. He never played that well for Cincinnati and they, and the, and the giants were desperate. And so they traded him and BJ Hill has played. And now he's had to play more because of the, and the injury to Larry Ogunjobi in the interior of the Bengals line, he's just played great. So while I think you notice Trey Hendrickson and some of the other elements of the Cincinnati defense. I was so glad that BJ Hill got that, you know, batted and then uh, caught interception against Patrick Mahomes, you know, a really good athletic play. I was happy he got that because maybe it'll shine some light on a guy who's really been huge for this team. So many little personnel decisions that add up to big wins when a team makes it this far that isn't supposed to. Uh, those are all interesting. And as, as we're getting to know Zach Taylor more and really uh, kind of uh, you have to give him a lot of credit for where he's come and what he's done with his team. What stands out to me two days after that comeback, and th this is kind of a, a minor in the weeds thing, Peter, but 
they spent most of that game Sunday in Kansas City chasing the Chiefs. I mean, they were down a lot in the first half, 21-3. They were down a lot of the second half. They still found a way to get Joe Mixon 21 carries. I mean, think about how many teams erase a massive deficit and still get their running back, who isn't the most important part of their team, the quarterback throwing it is, they still get him over 20 carries. That just said to me, Zach Taylor has so much confidence in allowing Joe Burrow to just play his game and so much belief in what he's doing offensively that even being at Arrowhead, being down 18 to Patrick Mahomes isn't going to chase him away from his game plan. I was just so impressed with that looking back at it. The other thing about the Bengals that I think is so significant because every one of these games is close is that I think they've got a huge advantage, nothing against Matt Gay, but they got a huge advantage at kicker. They'd have an advantage at kicker over anybody, I think, other than probably Justin Tucker because Evan McPherson has had, and, and this is not an exaggeration, he's had the greatest season that a rookie kicker has ever had. And I say that because he has made more 50-yard field goals in one year, 11, regular and postseason, than any kicker in NFL history. And, you know, obviously he had another one in Kansas City on Sunday, and Paul, 12 for 12 in field Mm -hmm. goals, four for four in each playoff game. And as close as these are, I think he's, he's got a good chance of, being the big being being a hero or being really influential again and one of the quotes of the year i i uh and it's not necessarily politically correct but i i asked him about the pressure and how he deals with the pressure because it doesn't seem i mean he's just like joe burrow you know you have no idea it looks like they're having they're in a scrimmage in in May with nobody in the stands. And I asked him about that. And he said, being a kicker is like being a sniper. You get one shot. Yeah. And I I thought that was really kind of, obviously, as I say, it's not politically correct, but it's very self-aware about the pressures on that job. You're thinking about pressure, Peter. It's, it's the one time during games that um, in addition to being just excited to to see what the outcome is going to be, I get so nervous because I I spent two years holding for kicks and you get more nervous for holding for kicks than you do for actually playing quarterback, at least in my experience. So uh, whoever number 10 is for the Bengals, I I should know his name, but I'm always watching number 10 when it comes in. Huber. Yeah. Yeah, There there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Pro assist there, Peter. Thank you very much. But I always go to that guy because you stand there for, for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, knowing you got to come in and catch that and hold it. So, it's a, it's a minor part of that sequence, but I, I'm always nervous for the holder and happy when they come through. Paul, one Kansas City point. I want your theory about why Patrick Mahomes and that offense went to sleep on the last eight drives of the game. Isn't it just crazy that it, it, yeah. if someone could have, could have frozen the TV and said 21-3, they will never score another touchdown the rest of the game. They'll get the ball eight more times and won't score. It's still incredible two days later. First of all, with all the blame to Mahomes and all the credit to the, to the Bengals' defense, we'll get to that. I do want to point out that the first time the Chiefs had the ball in the second half, Peter, they had Kelsey and Hill, hands both hands on football, to convert a second down and a third down. And both of those key players dropped them. They had their hands on them. They could have made those plays. Who knows yeah. what happens if they move the ball in that first drive? Those two all-pro players could have made plays, and they didn't. Then a lot of attention now being given, as it should, to the Bengals' switch to dropping eight instead yeah, of rushing four and dropping seven. Dropping eight has gotten a lot, of, a lot of attention. And to me specifically, when you drop one more person against that team, Peter, it allows you, and I don't know what the one extra person did on each one of those occasions, but you can now double kill, which they did a lot in key situations. You can leave one safety 30 yards deep and one 15 yards in the middle. You can't do that if one of them's rushing. You can drop a spy back five yards and kind of take over that space where, where Kelsey gets an automatic seven, eight yards. And they did all those things. So to me, two days later, it's more about realizing, okay, the switch to dropping eight was good and it was terrific. It was what they were able to do with that extra defender dropping back. When you have eight against five, Peter, five pass catchers out, eight defenders back 
it's a pretty good ratio. You're not going to win every time, but it is it is significantly better than seven on five when you can double hill, when you can play deep with the safety, and you can take away the Kelsey little hook zone. And they did all those things. You know, um, I, I really like that explanation. I think going forward, as we sort of look at the Super Bowl, I think one of the underrated characters in the Super Bowl is going to be the Bengals defensive coordinator, Lou Anarumo. Nobody in America knows him. He's, uh, uh, he, you know, he's a, he's a, he's just a quiet, very under the radar guy who, if you talk to guys like Trey Hendrickson and I talked to BJ Hill, uh, I think one of the really, really interesting things about Anarumo is how he has dealt with a lot of different guys going in and out of the lineup, not only because of injuries, but because of trades, because of free agency. And he has really formed a really good defense. And I think the, as I just look at it, Paul, right now, I think Sean McVay uh, against that defense and what the Bengals or what the Rams are going to come up with against that defense. I think that's going to be one of the huge stories uh, of this Super Bowl. Give me your key storyline or your, your sort of big key to this matchup between these two teams. This is, this is kind of a, a, a second level key, Peter. It's, it doesn't deal with um, kind of the main headline, but I think it's going to be huge in this game, watching how the Bengals came back and, and how they eventually separated from the Chiefs. Think about how many times Joe Burrow made plays with his feet, Peter. I mean, I think he picked up four or five first downs just running on second or third down. And there were a couple of key down the field kind of throws where he really avoided pressure, moved to his left, ran to his right, and threw on his run, uh, threw on the run. You take away those six or seven plays, and the Bengals are home right now watching the Chiefs play. So I'm yeah. watching to see if Burrow can be as effective on third down. And again, like the Rams were against the Niners, the Bengals were over 50% on third down. And if someone would have told you that before the game, you're like, oh, Joe Burrow's making great reads and great throws, which he did. But I would say at least half of those conversions, he was moving. He was moving to run or moving to throw. If he can have that kind of success again, to give the Bengals a real chance. And if the Rams can cut that off, I think that helps their chances significantly. Paul, in the last few minutes, Let's look at a couple of coaching uh, decisions that teams have made. Uh, and let's just talk for a minute. I, I'm really interested in the Las Vegas Raiders and sort of the combo platter of Dave Ziegler as general manager and Josh McDaniels as the head coach. Um, I didn't know that this day would ever come for McDaniels, not just because of you know, how uh, this second year in Denver, he really failed there. But in, in leaving the Colts at the altar in 2018, I think I thought that that was really going to haunt uh, Josh McDaniels for a long time. Um, and I'll just say this. A lot of people would say, well, you know, Josh McDaniels, uh, he was in a good situation why in the world would he go to the Raiders? It's, it's a, you know, they're a bunch of, it's like the land of misfit toys. And, and, and I just, I had, I just had this feeling when I saw him take that job, you know, the reason why jobs are open is because things aren't perfect. How many times is a perfect job open? And look at what the Raiders have. Okay. The Raiders have, um, a quarterback. And look, a lot of people are going to say, well, Derek Carr, he can only get you so far. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think Derek Carr is a little better uh, than people give him credit for. He's not a top five quarterback, but I think he's, you know, he's good enough to win with for sure. And I always knew that McDaniels was never going to take a job unless he had a quarterback he felt he can win with. But the other thing I think he felt like he wanted to have control over his situation. Hmm. And how well does he know Dave Ziegler? He's the one who basically 
brought Dave Ziegler into the NFL. And so they're friends from way back from their college days. And so I think even though, and, and plus look, Mark Davis, this is my feeling about Davis, weird guy, all that and everything, but I just don't think Mark Davis is going to interfere. He didn't interfere with Gruden and Mayock. Uh, I, I, I think he's not going to interfere. He's going to let these guys do what they think is best. So I think it's going to be hard to win a lot there. I mean, I don't think it's going to be hard with that quarterback and the talent they have to be close to 500, but to get over the teams in their division, it's going to be tough, but I happen to think this is a decent job. I think it's a really good job. And the word you use, it's not a perfect job. It's not even close to a perfect job, but this is a good one. I mean, how often do jobs come open where a team got hot late, go to the, they go to the playoffs and they're this close to winning a playoff game. It, it, it's a yeah. rare job that's open. That's a team that's already a playoff team. So he steps in, not with the expectation to make them competitive in December. Now the expectation in Las Vegas is now to, to be successful in January. So yeah. he starts he starts there, which a lot of these other coaches are not starting there. Derek Carr is a really good quarterback. And I'm interested in this one too, Peter, because I like it when head coaches, I don't want to say I like it when they fail, because I, I don't enjoy that part of it, but I like it when they get a second chance. I like it when they have to spend a few years going back to, to grinding yeah. and building to being a coordinator. Okay, a few years later, in this case, about a decade later, you're going to get another chance. And now we get to see the maturity. Now we get to see how they handle it differently. And I have some friends who were in that organization when Josh first got there that didn't have great things to say uh, about that environment. So can he create a better environment? Can he take Derek Carr to the next level? Uh, can this team that's already good be great when it matters most? Uh, there are a lot of reasons uh, to, to keep a close eye on and to be excited about what might happen there. Paul, I want to ask you your opinion about uh, about Brian Dable taking the Giants job and specifically here's year four an absolutely crucial year for Daniel Jones um, I like the matchup of those two guys but again I'm still not convinced about Daniel Jones uh, and he's not gonna have a long time to prove himself because I think if he plays poorly or, or is hurt again this year I think the Giants go looking for another quarterback in 2023. I think the interesting thing is, I will not be surprised if new GM Joe Shane um, trades, they got the fifth and seventh picks in the first round. Yeah, I think he hopes that someone wants one of those two picks for whoever it is, quarterback, mm -hmm. non-quarterback. Uh, I think he would love, Joe Shane, in my opinion, would much rather have multiple ones in 2023 than 22 but give me your take on Dable and what you know of him and and what do you think of of the match with Daniel Jones I I, I would take Daniel I, I would take Daniel Jones and keep him I would not I would not be in the market to trade him I think he's a decent quarterback that could go either way and that's that's a a fighting chance you have a fighting chance to succeed with this guy the big question for me Peter is Let's face it. I mean, Brian Dable got that job because of how well Josh Allen played and the role he played in taking Josh from a super talented kid to an unbelievably efficient, smart, patient, explosive kind of quarterback. And he had a big part in that. So now he goes to a place where he has a bigger role than just that. That was his number one job yeah. was to figure out how to get Josh Allen from here to here. He did that. Now he's responsible for the entire team. Can he give that same kind of detail and energy to Daniel Jones that he was able to give Josh Allen? Probably not. And Daniel Jones isn't nearly as talented. So that's, his, uh, that's an exciting little subplot there uh, to see if he can pick up where he left off with the development of a young quarterback. One side note on, on Brian Dable, and you and I have a number of these, Peter, from, the, from how long we've been around it. 10 or 12 years ago, I was calling the preseason games for the Chiefs. And I would go in in the summer toward the end of minicamp and – watch just like one practice and spend time with whatever coaches wanted to spend time with me to get to know the team. So I could kind of present those stories in August for the fans. And I was there the last day of mini camp. As soon as practice got over, all the coaches left. One guy stayed because he knew I'd asked for time. And that was Brian Dable, who was with the chiefs. Then he stayed 
I know his family, they were literally waiting to go on vacation that day. <laughs> and he stayed for about an hour to draw up concepts. This is what we're trying to do offensively this year. We're trying to do this with this draft pick. I want to take our quarterback from here to here with this. He was wonderful, not only with just the insight, but the kindness to stick around when he probably had other things to do that he wanted to do more. So um, that, that's where my mind goes when I think about the Giants new coach. You know, some other interesting, uh, you know, coaching decisions have to be made. Um, normally, if if what we were saying was going to, you know, be broadcast right now, it'd be fine. We could talk about these. But the danger of a podcast is by the time it airs, two more of these jobs could be filled. Right. <laughs> but so we'll see. But. I'm really curious, honestly, uh, the most the most curious name I've got so far is Brian Flores, because I mean, think about it. It has been now, as we record this, 22 days since he the stunning firing of Brian Fl Brian Flores. And so far, no job. Now, who knows? Maybe Houston. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't know. Uh, and I do think he's going to end up with one of these jobs, but that has been a little bit of a surprise. But let's see where we are next week at this time, uh, because I would expect that Flores will uh, will end up with one of these jobs. But anyway, Paul, thanks so much for joining me this week. As always, thanks for your knowledge. Thanks for always being there for me. And uh, I really appreciate everything you do to make this podcast so much better. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.